Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's interesting what's going on here in Isaiah 58. The people are complaining against God. They're complaining that uh, God has not done right by them. They say, Why have we fasted and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't noticed? It's quite an amazing thing, isn't it? When people complain to God that God hasn't done right, they are assuring God that they've done everything they ought to do, but God hasn't done his part. And whenever somebody complains that God isn't doing what he's supposed to do, you know there's something wrong with the person complaining, right? There's certainly something wrong with the complaint because God always does what is right. Here's God's response. On the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. These people thought they were getting away with uh, all the evil things they were doing. They thought they could just uh, keep, keep on doing whatever they wanted to do. God should forgive them. God goes on. God says, is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? People had the idea back in Isaiah's time that they could do whatever they want, come into worship, confess their sins, and go out and keep on doing the same wicked things that their, that their fleshly souls desired. They were sadly mistaken. And so are we, if we think we can come to worship, confess our sins, receive his forgiveness, and then not change in the least. God expects that when we turn from our sins and turn to him and confess our sins and he forgives us, there's going to be a different way of living. God expects as a part of repentance that we change what we say and do, how we live that we show his love to those around us. If there's no change, God is not pleased. God wants us to see God wants to see us following his law, which means loving people, caring for them and caring for their needs. This goes on here in Isaiah. God expresses what he's looking for. Isn't this the kind of fast I'm is is not this the kind of fast I've chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Isn't it to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? God's saying, here's the kind of worship I want, where truly you come and and recognize what God does in his word and hear it, but then you live it. You live it by showing God's love to people like uh, loosing the chains of injustice, setting the oppressed free, sharing your food with the hungry, providing the poor wanderer with plate with shelter, and on and on. To show God's love to the people around us is what he's after. There should be a difference, God says, in the way we live. Jesus underscores that when he says in Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can be made salty again? And again, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill can't be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. What Jesus is saying is God made you to be somebody who's going to impact this world. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. But if salt isn't salty, what good is it? If you're the light of the world, but you don't shine your light, what good does that do? What good is it to be a Christian in this world and not show it, not live it? Does it impact people's lives? God expects for there to be a change. He expects not only for us to come to worship, and he does expect that. To 
This is where we receive his forgiveness, where we hear his word and are built up in him. But having been built up, he expects us to go forth. God says, in the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let people see it. It's going to be God working through you, of course. When you're doing good deeds, it's God working through you. But let people see that so it will make a difference. Let them know about God's love as you show it to them, as you tell them about God's love. Tell them about all that God has done. And as the Spirit brings them to faith, then they will praise your Father in heaven. See, that's the goal God has in mind, that we all be one in him, that we all be brought to wholeness in him. This is what God's law is about, and it doesn't change. Jesus made that extremely clear. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And now he gets very particular. He says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. God's law is not going to change because his law is his will. His will is immutable. His will is that we love God and love one another. That's not going to change. Never going to change. That is God's will and desire. It's who he is. God is love. And so God is not going to change in the least about this. But now comes something, something that Jesus says that gives pause. Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees and the scribes, you won't get into heaven. And that's a concern. Because you know what the, the Pharisees and the scribes were all about. I mean, they worked really hard at keeping God's laws. They uh, even made other laws so that you wouldn't break into God's laws to, to kind of surround them like a fence around them. Oh, they worked hard, and they prided themselves in keeping God's law. They were very good at it. But they weren't perfect, were they? They didn't keep God's law perfectly. They were sinners as you and I are. But they did, they did a, about the best job a human being could do, who isn't Jesus. <laughs> they did pretty good. And this says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of what the scribes and Pharisees have done, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. You think you can be good enough? to surpass what they did? I don't think so. I don't think we can. But God can. And Jesus has. He led a perfect life. Perfect. But more than that, his sacrifice on the cross takes away our sins and provides for us a righteousness, a perfect and holy righteousness. Jesus gives us his righteousness. Our sins are put on him. He gives us his righteousness. And this is a righteousness, a perfect righteousness, that far surpasses the quote-unquote righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because of the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, Heaven is ours. Jesus has made that possible. And because of that, we are so thankful and want to live for our Lord and do for him anything we can. We want to live in service to him. And that's, uh, that's what, uh, what we're hearing here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, God says, uh, come to you, and Paul's writing here, when he says, I come to you not in uh, words of wisdom or in eloquence. When we're preaching God's word to you, if we come in our own wisdom, it's nothing. But when you hear God's wisdom, it's a whole nother thing. It's an amazing thing to think that we could have God's wisdom, and yet we do. It's very clear. It's a wisdom that had been hidden for ages. So many people didn't know about it. 
But that wisdom has been revealed to us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 says, God has revealed his wisdom to us by his spirit. He revealed it to us. We know that wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is such foolishness to the world. God himself getting on a cross and dying, that's wisdom, says the world. Doesn't seem like it. But we know better because God has revealed it to us. There's this great wisdom that because of what Jesus has done for us with his life and his death and resurrection, that he gives to us a perfect and a holy righteousness that heaven is ours. And God's wisdom is also that having received that righteousness without us doing a thing, all by, all by what Jesus has done, God's wisdom also includes this, that having received that righteousness, that we will live for our Lord, that we will be tasty salt in the world, lights that shine and brighten up people's lives as God works through his word in our lives. As God works through us to show his love and to tell about his love and what he's done. God calls upon us to make a difference in this world. His wisdom is clear, plain, easy to understand when the Spirit has worked that faith in your heart. It's clear that heaven is ours and ours completely because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done the righteousness we receive from him and how he calls us to be tasty salt in this world as we proclaim the things he has done as people see the works that the Holy Spirit is doing through us and praise our Father in heaven Amen The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting Amen